Hi, welcome to lesson two of week three, in which we talk about structures and in particular the if structures. The aim is to learn to use if blocks to write branching code. And after this lesson, you'll be able to use a simple if block to branch between code that executes or not, depending on a logical test. And then you'll be able also to use else if and else blocks inside an if block to choose among several code branches. So the reserved keyword if is a very important one. It like function, it, it opens a code block, and it must be closed by the keyword end. However, they differ in scope. The scope of an if end block is global. The keyword if does not create a local scope. Uh, the other thing is that the if uh, keyword must be followed by a truth value, which is normally the result of a logical test. The code body of if consists of the lines after the logical test and before the end. An if block may contain only one code path, if we like. In that case, if true end will ensure that the code in the code part is executed and if false end will simply skip over the code. And this is the simplest kind of branch you can introduce into your code. And let's uh, look at the examples. So unfortunately, the typing is uh, slightly long-winded in this lesson. So I've actually done most of the typing, and I'll just um, go between them in the, uh, at the Julia prompt. So here's the first. If uh, the test, the result of the test a greater than 1 is true, then you print that a is greater than 1. And so uh, we try that. This is important. So it was, it's a nice test, there's no problem, but it gives us an error because it's trying to carry out a test that is not possible because the name a has not been bound to any value. So what we need to do is to give a a value. So a, say, equals 4. And we can put it all on one line. a is greater than 4. If we say a is minus 4, it doesn't work. If we say a is equal to 1.0, nothing happens because uh, you can compare uh, a float and a, a, an integer but it is not true that the float 1.0 is greater than the integer 1. So because this is uh, slightly tedious to test, we can put the whole thing into a bit of a function. We can create the function if eg1 of a, and then all it does is uh, does exactly the same if code branch as before. So the purpose of this function is just to do the illustrations that I spoke about. Um, they can now be done much more quickly. So we have a whole lot of other ones that I want to go through. Um, and then we create if eg1 of a. And now I can ask for if eg1 of, say, minus 4, and nothing happens. But if it's eg1 of 4, then we get the results we are looking for. So we can now put this in a comprehension as well. So this is a, quite an interesting result if we look at the comprehension. Um, and there, there's the actual, the first example I want to show. So this is just x takes the values 0, 1, 2, and 3. And the, it runs this. If a is bigger than 1, it prints it out. So it should not print out a, a result for 0 and a result for 1, but it should print out the result for 2 and 3. And that's right. Oh, it does print out 2 print lens, but it also creates a four-element array. Well, of course it creates an array because it's a comprehension. And this four-element array contains nothing. The reason for that is that actually there is um, a value created by the print lens function. The print lens function does some stuff on screen. That's not creating any value as such. 
but it does create a value called nothing. So nothing is a specialized value in Julia. We don't really talk about it in this course. It comes up when there is actually really no value at all. So somehow there's the, the paradox that um, the, the value nothing means that there is no value. We can make that slightly clearer if we call um, if we call this, then we see that we get the value x and we get a four element array. And the four element array, the x itself is a four element array. That is the array that is created by the values that come from the println function and there are no values. And the, this yes, yes comes out on the screen. Um, we could actually put in a true and then instead of println, this will be the last value in this sequence, which is the value true. And so we should see true coming out whenever that's true. So what is happening here is that I have the values minus 1, 2, 3, and 51. And um, let's take out the minus 1 at the beginning because that is not what I wanted. So it's true for all three and it comes out like that. And if we put out the true before that, then we see that although we create the value true just as we do here and the element gets the value true, in this case, the last value generated is from println and it's again nothing. So that's for simple branching where we choose between doing something or not doing it. It's just if something, if the test is true, we do the code. If the test is not true, we just skip over it. Here is a, a function that allows us to choose between uh, printing A is bigger than B or printing A is not bigger than B. That's uh, if eg2. So let's call up if eg2. Uh, here it is. So if eg2 A, B, that is the function is created with two variables, which so they supply a value that is bound to the local, local name A and the local name B. If A is greater than B by the comparison operator, then we print an A is bigger than B. And if it's not, uh, otherwise we print that it is not bigger than B. I can now say if eg2 and I can compare 2 and 22. A is not bigger than B. I can also compare the character B and the character A. And so this is a nice little paradox that the local variable with the name A has the value of the character B and the local variable with the name B has a character A as its value. And it turns out that it says that A is bigger than B. Um, if we, of course, make that something which cannot be compared, then we get an error. Okay, so what else is doing here is, is if all else fails. Um, so um, let's look at the next section because this will make it clearer. With Goldilocks eating porridge. She says that if the porridge is greater than 55 degrees C, that the porridge is too hot. Then there's another test. If the porridge is less than 45 degrees C, she says the porridge is too cold. Otherwise, if both of these are false, she says the porridge is just right. So here's the first test of the, of the if block. And 
If this is not satisfied, we go down further. So if this, is, if this is true, we print that. But if this is not true, we go to the next choice point, the next branch, which is the else if. And this is a branch which has got its own. Um, this branch contains two possibilities. Either this is true or else we go on to this. You can actually have more else if, if you could have had um, possibilities of the porridge degree. Um, if they, it's less than 45, then you can test whether it's actually less than 20, in which case there's another remark. Um, it doesn't really matter. You can have many, many else if tests. And um, the first test for which it is true, uh, the function says, okay, that's the one we choose there. The if, branching if says that. Okay, so we can say Goldie says on 60 degrees, well, that's too hot. On 40 degrees, that's too cold. And even if it's exactly 45, the porridge is just right. Ah, nice. Now, one of the things that happens is that in coding in general, there are many ways of achieving exactly the same result. So there are many solutions to any given problem. You should be aware that in this case, if you had an if that had this logical test, you could say, I do this logical test and then I print that. And I do this uh, logical test. And if this logical test is true, then I print just right if it's at the end, so it's both the case that it's true that it's greater than 45 and that it is less than 55. That's when it's just right. Otherwise, if it is too cold, it's too cold, and if both of these are false, then it must be too hot. Um, and we can actually also see that you don't have to do your if structure in this way. You can put things on one line, and uh, here's a one line version of the whole thing. The reason for using a structure like this is simply to help the human reader to understand exactly. So, okay, so here's, if this is true, then there's a code body, and this code body can become very long. And similarly, this code body can become very long. So it's for human convenience that it's broken up. If you wanted to write your code very densely, not taking many physical lines on the screen, then you do things like this. I want to talk about the possibility of else if ladders and just to give you some advice about that. So if you have to choose between many options, then you can have many, many, many else ifs. And you can have this thing which is a long else if ladder. And the code can start looking quite difficult to, un to, to understand and to work your way through. And this is unfortunately a reality in coding. Such a problem is usually hard. The logic of choosing where and what to eat when you go out may mean choosing among several eateries. There are several many options in each of them. Then there's a question of how you travel and or um, where you can go, or indeed whether you can go, you can have desert, depends on what you had before. And suppose you were trying to put that entire choice into logical tests. Uh, just one big if, or maybe several stages in its choosing. Um, and that can be a very difficult and long and hard job to code, and it, uh, very hard to test, and it's a nightmare for anybody else to read. My advice is, firstly, don't tackle problems like this when you're a beginner. Secondly, as you start doing more and more difficult problems, do not worry about style. The first issue is to make sure you get the logic right. Once you can really get logic correct, you can start worrying about style. In fact, you will develop your own style, which will be the way that it's easiest and clearest for you to decide whether the logic is correct. And that is what I think you should focus on. Okay, so let's look at the uh, review and the summary. Uh, an if end block has global scope. The syntax is that you apply a logical test first off, and if there are more options, 
There are many options. You will need further logical tests to choose uh, which one of them to, to use. And if you like, if all of the logical tests that you've tried so far fail, then you put a default uh, code in there. Each logical test is an expression, and it's the result of that expression is that it ends up either true or false. And you can have many repeated else if. So this else if followed by its code, uh, code body can be repeated many times over. Beginners shouldn't worry about the style of their if blocks, but they should make sure that they get the logic correct. And of course, we're talking about formal logic here. So that's the end of lesson two of week three.